committees, the advisory panels. I mean, you can see that we have a lot of information that we live there, that we know this stuff, and that they could, you know, we could have input that would be valuable on these committees. And, uh, but, you know, I went to one, I went to the Energy Advisory Committee recently, and I wanted to talk to them. The mayor's, uh, Randy Kuahara had come back from the Philippines, and he was gonna brief them on how wonderful it was, and it was clean, and all of this stuff. And so I had some questions I wanted to ask about you know, are there any accidents? Has anybody been sick? Are there setbacks, uh, blowouts? You know, uh, and they didn't ask any of the questions. They told me you can't ask these questions. You know, you, you can't. Well, they said we could ask questions before it started, before he said anything. We didn't know what he was going to say, so we didn't know what to ask. So after he started talking is when I wanted to ask some questions. And they basically said, just sit down and shut up. You can't talk. And that's pretty much how it's been. Um, and it's still like that because we see again the Department of Health now uh, waiving environmental requirements for them. So there's less protections. They're giving them less protection. All this stuff has been going on, and the governor and the mayor and and, and uh, uh, Department of Health they they're trying to say oh there's too many uh, roadblocks. There's too many environmental things. So I'm um, going to talk about economics, the cable, they want to build this cable, and, and a lot of this is about, you know, they're talking about anyway, they want to take this power for Maui and Oahu. So in 1990, the state did an, their thing, they spent $26 million to look at the cable, and what they said was that the cable would cost a billion dollars. So we had Northwest uh, Penny Defense Fund, actually had Northwest Economic Associates out of Seattle, Washington do an economic analysis because we didn't think that the state's uh, analysis was correct. And they said that the cable would, at then, in 1990, was going to cost $4 billion. So we think now that with the, uh, inflation and all the, the way things have gone up since 1990, that's 20, 22 years, that the cable is a good bet that, you know, we could say the cable is probably could be $10 billion. So. Um, you know, that's the taxpayers, we're going to have to pay for that stuff um, because it's not economic for them to do it. For $10 billion, you can put a photovoltaic, $20,000 photovoltaic system on every house in the state of Hawaii. So just for the cost of this cable, without building any of the power plants or anything. But the problem with that is HELCO isn't going to make any money. And, and that's what we think this is really about. It's like keeping Hawaii Electric Industries alive and HELCO and uh, they don't really want solar and some of these other things because uh, the right people aren't going to make money. And our future, our energy future of Hawaii should not be based on making HELCO uh, money or making anybody money. It should be on what's best for people of Hawaii. So um, one, of the one of the other things is that we, we hearing that it's going to take 100 megawatts of power just to push just to push it through because there's resistance when you push power through cables. And so they're going to need 100 megawatts just to get it over there. So that's on top of what they're going to use. Um, the governor is talking about 1,000 megawatts. We really don't know. See, it's all a secret. It's like, where are they going to build them? We ask them, where are you going to build them? How many are you going to build? How big are they going to be? It's all a secret. We're not allowed to know. And it's like, I don't get that. I don't understand. So we pay the highest rates in the United States. I mean, they may pay more on Molokai or whatever, but the average in the United States is 9.7 cents per kilowatt hour. Here on this island, we pay for the first three, 300 kilowatt hours, 40.1 cents, for the next 742, and then 43 uh, cents. So we pay over four times what they pay in the mainland for our power right now, which means we pay, we pay enough to, uh, to do anything we want. I mean, they say solar doesn't work, but solar, they're, they're basing that on U.S. 9.7 cents kilowatt hour. Uh, I don't know about down here, but where we live in between here and Pohiki, almost everybody's on solar. And it works. I mean, we're using it. We prove it. So they have the, uh, the mayor had this, or the governor, I'm not sure who did this. It was the, the legislature actually had this geothermal working group. And part of the mandate that they did was they were supposed to do an economic analysis of all of this stuff. So when you read it, they did their final report. The only thing that they did in their economic analysis was compare oil to geothermal. They didn't look at any of this other stuff. So, um, you know, they didn't look at, you know, how does this compare to solar, conservation, wind, wave energy, cogeneration, and microgrid. 
So, you know, we've been doing that. And we have really become really knowledgeable about energy issues. Uh, and so I'm going to talk a little bit about that right now, some of the other things that we can do, and because they didn't do them. Um, so we also, you know, we, want, we don't want to just be protesters, and we don't want to just be these guys that are making trouble. We actually want to help, and we want to build bridges, and we want, to, we want what's best for everybody, not just, not just PGV or whoever's making the money, HEI, the health code. So Aurora's going to talk about what the community wants right now, and then I'm going to come back and show you what we can do as far as energy conservation. important thing to us and in our communities it kind of looks like this community right here you know it's a mixed bag of people but we're all in it together but what was rated the most important thing in our community in regards to geothermal was the right to the public practitioners and the highest vote was that the priority was if Pelly and her practitioners were taken care of then we're all going to be okay. So we geared this to the county council when they came out. And what we'd like is a study of the geothermal impacts upon Pele and her practitioners. There's some people that have a lot of money that have been talking about, well, nobody's been arrested for worshiping Pele, so there's really no problem with geothermal and Pele practitioners. Um, and I know that's not true. Because I live with public practitioners, and it hurts. It hurts bad. You know, I'm just this white girl from California who lived here for 30 years. But the way I see it, Kelly's right in the middle of giving birth to another island. I don't think she's liking drill that's put into her. So, what we want most important is to see what the impacts are before there's any further geothermal development. <laughs> We'd like an independent health study of the geothermal neighbors. Um, one health study was done by Texas A&M University. And one of the biggest things they found was the neurological damage that's done to people from H2S and Y. To put it simply, the folks that live in Hilo, they compare. They're Apple computers. Us by geothermal, we're PCs. Sometimes we don't, can't find the word at the end of the sentence. So we need a, a, a comprehensive health study. We need some Jerome H2S monitors for all our households surrounding PGV. Yeah. That's what this is. Department of Health has them sitting on the shelf. PGV has them. PGV is supposed to use best available technology. When PGV comes out to my house when it's leaking, they come out. Now, the gases roll on the, on the ground. They put this on the top of their truck while they sit in it and face it away from the plant. Oh, wow. They also come out with a, a clipboard and a pencil, and they write down what they see. Now, the EPA bought us this monitor. On the back of it is a little box. It's a data logger. So it goes right into a computer. So there's no erasing the data that's logged. It also has an alarm set. So if you have an asthmatic child, you can set it at a very low level and it'll wake you up and let you know. So at least you can get out. Right now, how it stands, if there's leaks of PGV, this monitor has picked up 620 parts per billion in my house one hour before their monitor picked it up. I mean, we're exposed while we're sleeping. We are gassed in our sleep from PGV. Everyone needs to have this as long as this plant is there. The plant shouldn't be there, but as long as it's there, it's the only notification we have. The asset fund is a geothermal asset fund PGV has put over $2 million into for mitigation purposes. When we met with the county council, we asked for 
half that money to go to monitors and half go to community health studies. What I've heard is they're working on resolutions to do that. It's just a matter of all those people working together and saying what we want and demanding it. Real-time online access of all Department of Health and PGD monitor systems. Now this was, this was suggested after the blowout and the Department of Health said all the recommendations were done. Well, PGD does have a, a website and you can look at a tiny box that will give you a five minute average. But if I want to know what I just read in last night, we have no access. If we all have air monitors, we all put our data logger into the computer, everybody around the world can see what everybody's being exposed to. Let's just acknowledge it. If you have a disease, you can't fix it unless you acknowledge it. We need to acknowledge how bad this power plant really is. Relocation rules to be revised to allow residents within three miles to get out. As the rules for relocation stand right now, again, when they wrote the permit, they knew people were going to be impacted. So they said, don't worry, we'll get the county money to relocate people. How the rules stand are, so you have to have had your permit for your house before PGB had theirs on October 3rd, 1989. So that means, if you live next door to me, and you breathe the same gas I do tonight, that you moved in three years ago, you can't be looking. Well, that's not fair. We're all going to gas people. Fortunately, the last administration, county lawyer, allowed somebody to not to be relocated that was after 1989. So, precedent has been set. Anybody that wants to be relocated, or do you live within one mile, three mile, any mile, I would highly suggest apply for relocation because the rules are up for change right now. At one point, uh, one of our council women changed the rules to allow the money to go out to the community and pay for roads. Those rules are going to be changed. But everybody needs to be protected. PGV should just be shut down, but until then, we need to be able to be safe. We are having a workable evacuation plan for the residents around PGV. And they've built a second power plant. And they can drill up to three wells if they want to in their permit. But we have no way to get out of there safely. We did talk with um, civil defense, and after our meeting with the county, they're trying to work on an evacuation plan, but they've been running 20 years now. I guess it's a little late. And uh, the EPA did a study specific on, specifically on PGP evacuation plans and decided there is nothing workable for us. Um, but I'm giving some faith in the civil defense that they're going to work on it. But we have a lot more people since, since um, the blowout. If anybody here lives around PGV or if you think you're getting gas, the best thing what we do um, is we have a jar of water with baking soda by our beds and a washcloth. If we're smelling gas and we need to get out, we shake the bottle, put the washcloth in and wet it, and cover our, our mouth and it abates it a little bit. But that's the level of urgency we live on and live with every day. It's really dangerous. Um, I'm just going to slide this in here right now because I think you all need to know. We live right next to a well that's being dug. Besides, it runs 24 hours a day. The permit allows them to. And it's supposed to only drill for 45 days. We're at day 75 today of drilling. And I've lived through all their drilling, and it's noisy and clanky, and it runs by, um, they're allowed nine diesel generators to run the drilling and the Halliburton machines to pump the cement down. So it's like living behind two school buses running and obeying chains. But this drill rig appears to be different. I don't, I can't say what they're doing because I'm not allowed up there, but it appears that they may be doing something on a sound or sonic frequency because for the last month, when I walk in my hallway or bathroom and same with our neighbors in enclosed spaces, first it sounded as sound, but now it's kind of a feeling where it's like 
at the speed of a helicopter blades, constantly. But I can, it started with hearing it reverberate, to now I can feel it where it's almost hitting the insides of my ears. And my daughter um, came back from Kona the other night, and a week ago, we can hear it hitting our, we can feel it hitting our chest. So I don't know, I mean, we know when they're doing the grinding of the ground, you can hear it. Sounds like two D9s going through a forest. Now we can feel it hitting our sternum. I don't know what this means. Maybe there's somebody that knows sound and frequency here, but the deeper they go, the deeper it's hitting our body. I don't know what that means, but I just want to let you guys know. <sighs> Feeling sucks. <laughs> And I'm going to pass this to Bob because I don't know what this picture is. Thank you. <laughs>